Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Mary Close Oppenheimer, president of the Salisbury Forum. And I want to welcome everybody tonight. We're really pleased to have you with us. Um, we have some terrific events coming up. So I hope you will save the dates. Chris Estes will be speaking on America's housing crisis on Friday, December 7th at the Hotchkiss School. On Sunday, January 27th, we'll be screening a documentary film at the Millerton Movie House, which will use personal stories to illustrate how the opioid epidemic is affecting the northwest corner of Connecticut. We exist for you. By filling out the survey you received upon entering, you'll help us identify the subjects that make us relevant to your interests. Please return it um, at the desk as you exit. There should be a box and there's some people uh, happy to collect your, your surveys. And uh, I wanna thank some of the students who have joined us tonight from a couple of the local high schools. They have helped hand out the surveys. They've joined us for dinner and we try to have student participation um, and a chance to meet some of our speakers every evening when we have a talk. So um, we're very pleased to have them here with us tonight. Uh, within the next few days, you should receive an appeal letter from us. We depend on you, our audience, for 75% of our operating funds. Please be as generous as your budget allows. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Joshua Ginsberg as our speaker this evening. He has dedicated 35 years of his life to conservation science and has a long resume of prestigious positions in environmental and ecosystem research project management, and education. During the 80s and 90s, he led ecology and conservation projects in Asia and Africa. He had a distinguished 18-year career at the Wildlife Conservation Society, where he was responsible for projects in 17 Asian countries. He is now president of the Cary Institute for Ecosystem Studies, which is one of the world's leading independent environmental research organizations focusing on understanding how ecosystems work. His dedication to environmental mission cannot be overstated. After years of living in the tropics, he had malaria twice, dengue fever twice, typhoid, cutaneous anthrax, and two systemic staph infections. I think most of us in this room would have changed careers years ago, <laughs> but Dr. Ginsburg has remained as dedicated as ever. As we all worry about climate change, we're very privileged to have Joshua Ginsburg here to share some of his expertise and a bit of optimism about what is being done to help mitigate the situation. So please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm going to start by saying, you may think I'm crazy. Right, to be an environmental optimist. And as I was thinking about this, it's been about six months, a little less than, since I agreed to do this, and my optimism waxes and wanes. And I'd like to still say, say that I am still an environmental optimist. Uh, but before we get to the optimistic things, you know, the, the arc of a talk should have a, a narrative thread, and we should start with doom and gloom. Right? And you know, there are lots of reasons to embrace doom and gloom. Uh, you know, we are living in a period, a uh, geological uh, era, which has been defined uh, as the Anthropocene, um, the geological period marked by a significant human impact on climate and the environment. And there are some really good scientific arguments about whether it started 10,000 years ago when we wiped out most of the megafauna uh, in, in the northern climes, uh, you know, whether it started in the late 18th century with, with the uh, beginning of the Industrial Revolution, whether it was really the, uh, the open air testing of nuclear weapons that left a signature in the soils of, of when humans really arrived. But it doesn't really matter. It's a period of 10,000 years, which in a geological era is an eye blink. So the one thing I think is clear is we are in the Anthropocene, and we are the dominant species with the greatest impact on the environment. The Keeling Curve is a set of data that have been taken uh, on Mauna Loa in Hawaii for the last 50 years, every week religiously, showing the uh, monotonic increase in carbon dioxide uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. They chose Mauna Loa because it's remote and it's easy uh, to work there. There are labs and, and, and all this is done at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography uh, in San Diego. Uh, 
And what has been the impact of that? Well, it's not a great surprise. Uh, land and sea surface temperatures are going up, right? And the probability of being affected by extreme climate events, uh, whether that's storms or wind or hurricanes, uh, major rainstorms, uh, is increasing. Right? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, but there is a report which, if you're doing doom and gloom, you cannot avoid. And the uh, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a few weeks ago uh, released a report in which they looked at the impacts of increasing average global temperatures by 1.5 degrees Celsius, or close to 3 degrees Fahrenheit. And the news was universally bad, and I have now read the report twice, and the, the summary more than that. And I'd say that while the news was bad, there is a positive spin, I'll do the best I can. Right? So the first thing you should realize is this is the current annual average warming. Because the, you know, the, the northern climes have warmed a lot more. They're up to two, two and a half degrees already. That, of course, affects ice melt and, and Greenland and, and the Arctic. But fundamentally, we are already measuring uh, significant warming in the, in the atmosphere around the world. Right? And that, over time, depending on the trajectory we take, and the IPCC is, you know, it, it ranges from 40 to 40,000, depending on how you count which report and who's involved. But it's, it's hundreds, if not thousands, of scientists. And so they really like consensus. And consensus reports always have a lot of you know, flex in them. And, and they consider what are the different probabilities of different things happening. So if you look, the likely range of modeled responses goes from you know, a one degree rise in temperature, which isn't so bad, up to a two degree, which is what they were modeling. And the 1.5 degree report was saying, what are the economic, social, and ecological impacts of going up 1.5 degrees or two degrees? And they really were looking at that difference of what seems like an inconsequential uh, temperential differ temperature differential of half a degree. And what did they find? Well, a rise of two degrees is much worse than a rise of 1.5 degrees. Right? It is nonlinear, and when you get up to two degrees, bad things start to happen. Right? And it's amplified for a variety of issues. Sea level rise really accelerates at two degrees. It's about twice as bad. Um, ocean acidity goes up significantly. Now, the oceans are not going to be acidic. They're going to be basic probably, at least for our lifetimes and for many lifetimes to come. But they're increasingly acidic, and they're, they're increasingly less basic. But saying things are less basic is sort of awkward, so we talk about ocean acidity. Um, droughts will be much worse at 2 degrees than 1.5, and storm and rain severity really increase as well. Um, species loss, which is something I care deeply about and have spent most of my life trying to stem, uh, is particularly bad for oceanic organisms that are sensitive to temperature, and coral reefs uh, are the worst. Now, uh, they said a loss of 99% of corals at 2 degrees Celsius. I bounced that off a friend of mine, Jeremy Jackson, who was giving a talk at the Cary Institute last week, and he said, no, 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 no. He said, that makes sense if you just look at average temperatures in different environments. But there are reefs around the world that will survive because the water is cooler for many sort of biogeophysical reasons of upwelling and circulation and currents. But figure, okay, on a bad day, it's going to be, on a good day, it's going to be 80% of the coral reefs that are gone. Right? So it is not wonderful. Um, and then summer sea ice uh, is, is about double, not quite, uh, at 2 degrees versus 1.5. So take home message, 1.5, it's not great, but it's a much better target. Right? Um, what else do they say? Well, the risks to humans, right, directly to us, are exacerbated. And those risks have to do with health, um, transmission of disease, spillover of, of emerging infectious disease, global livelihoods and crops and agriculture and, and things like that, food security more generally, so not just where things grow, but what the probability and predictability of food growth is. Water supply, fresh water, is increasingly a challenge. And with the increased severity of storms and water coming all at once and then not at all, so you have droughts and you have very wet areas, it's going to get worse. And I did say I'm an environmental optimist, right? So hang in there. Um, and that this is going to lead to physical uh, insecurity and war. Right? And interestingly, the Department of Defense has several major funding streams looking at climate change because the Department of Defense, unlike other parts of the administration, doesn't have the luxury of dogma superseding reality. 
Right? They, they need to deal with the fact that naval bases are on the coast, that their troops are deployed in tropics around the world, and what does that mean for disease and, and disease transmission and so on. And finally, there's a big impact on economic growth. And because I know that people really like economic arguments, I'm going to just go a little bit into that. The economic costs of the 1.5 versus 2 degrees uh, have been estimated at somewhere between an 8% decline in global GDP and a 13% decline at 2 degrees. So again, you almost, not quite, double the economic impact by adding another half a degree. What does that mean? Well, if we go up to 1.5 degrees, if you want to limit that to 1.5, it's going to cost about 2.5% of the world's GDP. So we can limit it. We know how to do this. That's the first environmental optimist message. There are means and ways. There are things we know how to do something about, things that we're going to have to adapt to, and then things that just are going to happen because we're too far along the curve. I think a lot of species extinction is in that second and third categories. But from the point of view of economics, if we invest over the next 20 years 2.5% annually of GDP, we will be able to limit it to a 1.5 degree uh, rise. That's the IPCC's estimate. So if you invest 2.5%, you reduce costs by 5%, or effectively you get 100% return on investment. Right? So there is a strong economic argument for making changes now that will really drive uh, a decline in the rate of increase of temperature. If I haven't confused everybody, I'm, I'm not doing my job. Um, now, what does that mean? Well, you know, uh, Elizabeth Colbert who wrote a really wonderful book called The Sixth Extinction, staff writer for The New Yorker. She is a, writes beautifully, and she did a, a commentary last week saying, what is Donald Trump's response to their UN dire climate report? Right? I want to look at who drew it, you know, which group drew it. Now, I don't really love getting political as a scientist, but I am left with no choice. Um, and the question of who drew it Right, is a hard one because, of course, there are always scientists who are contrary. That is the nature of science. We argue a lot. We don't agree all the time. Um, but you know, if you look at the opinions of, of climate and earth scientists on, on the human role in global warming, the important categories of people who are active in the field, it's about a 98% group. Right? So if you draw out of the earth and, and climate scientists uh, who support the IPCC, yes, there are going to be people who disagree. but who drew it is not really the important question. Because the reality is, as I said earlier, the IPCC does consensus science. It is sort of the minimum we can all agree on. And scientists aren't great at agreeing on things. So if we all agree that these are the impacts, that's who drew it, Donald. Right? So that's where we are. Right? Now, what does this mean? Well, Trump came back and said, well, he has a natural instinct for climate change. And, and that may be. He has natural instinct for many things. Um, but what does that mean? Well, I think what we have to see is see how the instinct is manifesting itself into policy. Right? So it is you know, unwinding cl Obama's climate policies. It's drawing us from the Paris Accord. It is ordering a, a lifeline for nu struggling nuclear and coal plants. Nuclear plants are, from a climate perspective, a more interesting discussion because they don't emit uh, carbon dioxide and there is a, a, a really wonderful debate within the environmental community about the relative impacts of nuclear versus other uh, sources of renewable energy. Um, and what this manifests itself, and I'm just going to go through a few of the things. So one is a proposed uh, uh, rollback of the CAFE standards, the, the standards we use for uh, limiting or increasing the uh, energy efficiency of vehicles, right? The corporate average fuel economy standards. I had to write it out because CAFE standards is one of those things that we never remember what CAFE stands for. Um, and the reasons were pretty simple. It costs too much, right? Interestingly, the auto industry was not feeling that they needed to roll back quite as far as they rolled them back. In fact, they just wanted a little more time to reach the 57 miles to the gallon uh, fleet average. They didn't want to pull it back. And um, so the cost too much problem was, was not really serious. And it was based, the, the Obama administration based their, their work on outdated information. And there was a fairly significant you know, text on what this meant. But my favorite piece of it was something called the Prius fallacy. Right? They didn't call it that. They said, and you know, these standards, because they make lighter cars and people drive more, is going to lead to more deaths. So the fallacy is that more efficient vehicles will have, lower the cost of driving, 
which will result in people driving more. There's not a lot of data to show that that's actually true, but you know, it sort of makes sense, right? Good instinct, right? Um, and resulting in vehicle injuries and fatalities. So the CAFE standards, not just because the cars are lighter, but because their people are driving more miles because they're using less fuel, right? Um, and so you should have higher deaths when fuel prices drop, which you don't get in various other things. So fundamentally, those were the logics. Um, the Trump administration role is rolling back uh, the rule aimed at limiting methane production, uh, uh, pollution. And changes in methane regulation are really important because it's a really powerful greenhouse gas. It doesn't stay around as long as CO2, but oh my gosh, it's 84 times more uh, potent as a greenhouse warming agent uh, in terms of capturing heat in the atmosphere. Um, this rule is fortunately relatively limited because it only applies to federal lands and tribal lands. So the combination of this with much more leasing of oil and gas on federal lands will have an impact, but not quite as bad as it would if they just relaxed the regulations across all oil and gas production. And it's also, it's, as an environmentalist, it's a nice picture because you know, fundamentally, you know, the, 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 um, the things you do are uh, prevent leaks, um, you vent, but even more importantly, you flare. And the flare is really dramatic, so it's a nice environmental picture if you're trying to say, do we really want to do this in our national parks? Um, another thing that was done that I just wanted to use as a sort of heuristic advice to, uh, device to say it's not just a Democrat-Republican issue. This is a uh, science-non-science issue. Uh, just before he left, uh, Secretary Pruitt proposed a rule that would strengthen science. This is the EPA website's angle on it, using EPA regulations. And this was um, a way in which transparency, I think, is perverted. Right? So transparency was that you couldn't use science that you couldn't get down to the individual's in a study. And so, for instance, some of the studies on the impacts of, of air pollution, where they looked at rates of asthma or lung cancer or other things. There's a very famous Harvard study that did this. You wouldn't be able to use it because the individual identity of the participants is shielded by HIPAA rules. And if it's shielded by a HIPAA rule, it's not good science because you can't replicate it and you can't test it. And that would have kicked it out. And what I thought was interesting was that uh, you know, a distinguished congressman wrote that discarding the opportunity to engage in these important studies and those of the health consequences of air pollution, water quality, and toxic substances based on their use of private data would be a costly mistake given their potential to save lives. I won't finish reading it, but what's important to me is this was John Faso, who just lost his seat, uh, a not renowned great liberal Republican uh, congressman, but somebody who actually does care about the environment enough to write uh, acting administrator Wheeler and say, this is just a really bad idea. Um, in agreement with that are 18 states attorney generals, the National Academy of Sciences, and many other organizations that have uh, commented on this rule. And we will see if, whether it goes forward or not. Right? Um, the League of Conservation Voters has kept track of this you know, partisan split on the environment. And for those of you who were not born uh, before 1970, what you'll see is in the 70s, there was a difference between the Republican and Democrats and the House and the Senate, but fundamentally it was fairly tight. And it's only over the last 30 years uh, that we have really diverged in our views as a political issue. And it really confuses me because I thought clean air, clean water, and, and a healthy environment for our children was something that everybody wanted. And there is a book that came out last week, it was reviewed in Science this morning, which dissects why this is happening. But I think what makes me optimistic is it's not universal and we're starting to see some shifts back, um, as you can see, uh, towards uh, environmental uh, bipartisanship. All right, so let me sort of, again, plus minus, and then I'm gonna go into the happy stuff, I promise. Um, you know, one of the things the, the Trump administration and the Congress was trying to do was, was gut the uh, Endangered Species Act. Now, to be fair, there were some really good things they wanted to change. The Endangered Species Act is you know, almost 40 years old. It's got some problems. Science has come a long way. We could do better. The Australians have done a better job. The Canadians have done a better job. The EU has a better piece of legislation. The problem has always been once you open it up, you open it up for change in every direction. And so what we saw was, was uh, uh, an attempt to change that. Now, one of the things that happened on Tuesday, you might know, is that the House is now uh, in the hands of the Democrats. We have uh, a little more balance um, in our legislative branch. And so if we're going to overhaul the Endangered Species Act, which I think we should, we might be able to do it in a bipartisan way. Uh, 
right? Um, we're not going to do it so that we get rid of economic analyses. We're not going to do it so unoccupied critical habitat is excluded. Just think about that for a second. You have an endangered species. It's endangered because it's lost much of its range. And all the range it's lost, you then exclude from analysis because it's not there anymore. So how do you recover that species if all the unoccupied habitat doesn't need to be protected? Um, and there was a special rule that extends protection for threatened species, which I really like, because it says, let's try and do something before they're endangered. And it was going to remove that. Now, all this has gone away. And what's interesting to me is that it went away not just because of Tuesday's election, but because the vast majority of Americans, increasingly so, from 96 to 2015, support you know, the Endangered Species Act. And as people like clean air and clean water, they like you know, not having species go extinct. And it's interesting that the American people support environmental legislation, they support regulations that protect their health, uh, and somewhere in the political morass that gets lost. So I think it's really important that people are starting to talk about this. All right, so why is it getting harder to be an optimist? If you don't understand what I said for the first 20 minutes, um, Basically, it's because there's a lot of uh, administrative law and changes in regulations that's being pushed forward. And this administration is very focused on this. Um, I'll give Scott Pruitt you know, credit where credit is due. Uh, he did a pretty good job of moving forward administrative rule change in terms of the number of rules. And when you look at the rules overturned on these various substances, it's dozens and dozens. So why am I still an optimist? Right? Well, first... I'm an optimist because uh, Philip K. Dick, one of my favorite authors, said that reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. As a scientist, I actually think that science matters, that we can study problems, we can figure out what's causing them, and then we can find remediation. And I think we've done a pretty good job, and I'm going to argue and, and make the argument that we can do this. We've been here before. We know what we're doing. Second reason is Mitch Bernard. Right. Now, Mitch is the head of litigation at NRDC, Natural Resources Defense Council. And I just, I know Mitch, and I just picked him out. Um, there are a whole bunch of people around the country. I mentioned the state's attorneys general, uh, Environmental Defense Fund, uh, uh, Earth Justice, which we call, used to call Skullduff, Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund, and uh, individuals who are taking the government to court on many counts. And where the government has not done a good job is following the rules by which you change the rules. Right? So changing a rule under administrative law is fine, and you can do it for political reasons. You just have to document your logic. And you have to, particularly if the Obama administration spent 18 months on the Clean Power Plan, you can't just with a stroke of a pen say, eh, I don't like it, I'm going to do something else. You have to justify it. Right? And you know, now we get into why I couldn't give uh, uh, Frank my talk until yesterday, uh, because I, it keeps changing. Every day it keeps changing. Right? And um, the other day, the Supreme Court allowed a group of kids and a lawyer who support, represents them uh, and said, yes, you can bring a lawsuit that says that the Trump administration is you know, endangering your future through their lack of attention to climate change. And that was pretty big. Right? So the Supreme Court, right? this is not a liberal court. This is not a court where we'd have thought this would be a slam dunk. Um, I think it was seven to two. Um, this morning, I woke up, and this is a screenshot off my iPhone. You know, you'll see right up there. Uh, you know, it was Judge Block's Keystone XL. Why? Because the Trump administration simply discarded the effect, would ha the, effect the project would have on the climate. Right? And you can't do that. Right? So litigation is the first reason why I remain an environmental optimist. Look, it works both ways. There were a lot of lawsuits uh, aimed at the Obama administration from organizations and groups that didn't like what they were doing. And those lawsuits really are good things because they force us to play by the rules. And playing by the rules is something that, you know, this country has done well for a long time. And I still have try some trust in the courts to, to be a, a check and balance. Uh, the fourth estate, uh, the, the press does a pretty good job. And I think now in Congress we have balance. And that's what was, you know, the Constitution aimed to do. Right? Um, the other reason I'm optimistic is for depressing results from the right source. So the Climate Science Special Report, which is part of the fourth National Climate Assessment, was published last year. Who published it? It came out of the White House. Now, of course, it was leaked three weeks earlier. Sort of embarrassing that they leaked it because then they could not release it. Um, but fundamentally, this report said climate change is real. Um, 
you know, we're having, as I said before, fires, rain, heat waves, melting ice caps, and glaciers, sea level rise, ocean acidity. But what was critical was this was a report that came out of this administration because it was undeniable. Reality is that which when you stop believing in it, it still exists. Right? Um, another reason to be optimistic, so this is the bad news, that we are increasing CO2 uh, emissions. Big chunk of that comes from energy. Right? And if you look at energy-related CO2 emissions in the United States, they're declining. This is mostly because of natural gas, and we can talk about that some other time. But there is a beginning to the end of the story, and we are slowly getting ahead of it. If you look at overall CO2 emissions through time, we have, despite the fact that we're you know, pulling out of Paris, we're still making progress. And we're not the only country in the world that's making progress. So it's too little too, little too late, perhaps, but at least we're getting there. Right? And when Mike Bloomberg, you know, a, a, a man who actually did make his billions, um, and, and Carl Pope, who ran the Sierra Club for many years, 25, Right? When the two of them think they might write a book together, and you've got a cat, you know, the ardent capitalist and the ardent environmentalist, you've got to think that something might be happening and something might be true. And Bloomberg and Pope are making an argument that there is a reason to be hopeful. Right? And uh, just as the book came out, Bloomberg wrote an op-ed which more or less explained their logic. The first thing is, look, half the coal-fired power plants in this country have been shut down or converted to other fuel sources. And that has not changed in the last couple of years. Right? So you can't push water uphill. And if coal is uneconomic, it's going to be uneconomic, even as you start to try and shift uh, the underlying subsidies for it, we can't subsidize it enough to make it economic in the long term. Right? Um, and utilities are increasingly adding low-cost wind power to their rate base. Uh, and there are issues about the grid and how it's distributed, so I'm not saying it's a panacea. But, but there is a change that is being driven because of economic realities rather than necessarily policy per se. There are incentives, there are subsidies, but there are subsidies for everything. If you want to talk about uh, corn ethanol in Iowa, that's a whole other discussion. Right? And then I think one of the most interesting things is that 81 companies uh, signed the American Business Act on Climate tra Change. Right? They operate in 50 states, employ over 9 million people, $3 trillion in annual turnover. Um, and they committed to uh, recognizing that climate is a problem and that in their business operations, they had to do something about it. And these were not inconsequential corporations, right? Alcoa, Apple, Cargill. I mean, Apple sort of makes sense, lefty computers, right? But, but Alcoa and Cargill are not companies that you would normally expect, you know, aluminum producers and the largest agricultural conglomerates uh, are, are doing this, right? Monsanto, P&G, you, you can see that. And this idea of moving to a soft energy path of renewables is not a new one. Right? And I'll get to why it's really not a new one. Amory Lovins, uh, who's been talking about this for 40 years, wrote a book in 1977. And in it, he showed two different paths. This was the path we were on of increasing oil and gas, coal and nuclear. He got it wrong in that nuclear didn't grow that much. Oil and gas grew more, gas particularly, and, and coal started shrinking faster. And then he had a soft path, which is actually more similar to the path we are on. We're a little bit delayed. The soft technologies didn't really kick in in 2000. They're, they're out here. Um, and actually, they're probably out here. Uh, but fundamentally, we are more on a soft path now than we are on that hard path. Right? The Cary Institute, where I uh, work every day, uh, used to look like this. This is a 1974 active solar building. We put a roof over it. Uh, we changed it because the technology didn't work. And it was bleeding edge technology, and we were too far ahead of ourselves. But I think the important thing is in 1974, we were building solar buildings. Right? This is not a new idea. Right? People have been talking about the fact that we have been chopping down the fence around our house for fuel when we should be looking at nature's inexhaustible sources of energy, sun, wind, and tide. And the author of this said, I put my money on the sun and solar energy. Anyone know where this came from? I'm going to be really pleased if it's no one good. Um, let's see, there we go. It was a letter from Thomas Edison to Henry Ford in 1931. And I will thank my friend Jeremy Jackson. It comes out of his new book. Um, but fundamentally, we've been thinking about this for a very long time. And I think what's great is that we are getting there. You know, the REGI, the Regional uh, Green Gas Initiative, uh, has a cap and trade on 25 megawatts of plants in the Northeast. Uh, it's been renewed and expanded. You have California cap and trade. The states, 
corporations and individuals are stepping in where the federal government right now is failing us. Right? Uh, C40, which is an organization that Mike Bloomberg helped put together, is building sustainability into cities' operations. Right? And American cities and states went to the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change at the last meeting and basically said, look, we can meet the Paris targets even if the US pulls out, and here's how we're going to do it. And they made a commitment to that. Right? So that's good for the environment in many ways. Uh, Charlie Driscoll up at, at Syracuse worked with the Science Policy Exchange of which the Cary Institute is part, and, and looked at what happens with things like the Clean Power Plan. And what it showed is, you know, it's good for your health too. It's not just good long term for your health because of the environmental issues, it's good for your health more generally. And so this is showing reductions in uh, avoided deaths per year, three to 400 in Texas, New York. This is all the carbon, the fine particulate pollution, which causes asthma, lung cancer, and other diseases. And this is what happens if you put in the Clean Power Plan or something like it, and or coal disappears because it's uneconomical. Right? So there are good things happening, uh, and we know what they are, and there are many reasons to do them economic and otherwise. Renewables are getting to be a value, prop value proposition. Right? And I do think, in the end, that now that renewables are as cheap or cheaper than fossil fuels, it's much more likely that we'll accelerate the development of them. So 10% of electrical uh, needs are met with renewables right now. If you, uh, wind's at 7% and growing. If you throw in hydro, it's another 17%. So we're almost up to you know, 20% of our energy needs today coming from non-polluting sources, right? Solar voltaics are crashing in price. They're getting cheap. It is now almost, well, it is economical to build them without the 30% tax subsidy, but with the 30% tax subsidy, it's a, a credit you get when you build solar. It is a no-brainer, right? Um, and coal is disappearing. As I said, half of them nationally have disappeared. Um, wind power, you know, costs about $20 a megawatt, and coal about 30. It's, it's not a hard decision, right? It, you have to subsidize fairly heavily for that, you know, 50% subsidy to get it to be cheaper, right? So, I think that's another reason why I'm optimistic. Um, part of the challenge is, so the town of Washington, uh, Millbrook, where, where the Cary Institute sits, had a year ban on building new solar, in part because a lot of the solar corporate companies were just flooding in, in part because we have to change our aesthetics. This is what we think is pastoral and beautiful. And I would argue this is what is pastoral and beautiful. The difference between this and that is that this produces methane and releases carbon dioxide and is unsustainable. Uh, and oh, by the way, you don't make a lot of money doing this. Um, solar fields, on the other hand, are you know, carbon neutral in the long term, there are costs and benefits to producing them, but they actually produce income and, and give you a payback over time. Right? And I think there is an aesthetic challenge for us. And you know, the Cary Institute is putting in a 700 kilowatt solar field. And we were told we were the first one approved by the town of Washington after the moratorium, but we were asked to plant around it so people couldn't see it. And I begrudgingly agreed to that because I really think we have to start thinking of this as beautiful. Right? Um, I also want to sort of you know, get towards the end of the talk by talking about some things that we really have changed. Right? When I was growing up in New York City, along with Jim Dyer, uh, New York City was really a mess. Uh, as Jim says, you know, once upon a time you could touch the air in New York. And nobody in their right mind would put their foot or their toe in the water. Right? Now that's changed. Right? What do, why did it change? Well, you'll wonder why I put Richard Nixon, Hubert Humphrey, and, and Ed Muskie up there. Uh, well, it's not, we have to take, I couldn't find a picture of Muskie and Nixon. Uh, this is uh, President, his, the person who ran against him, and his Vice President, but more importantly, Ed Muskie wrote you know, was, was the lead author in the Senate on the uh, Clean Air Act. And Richard Nixon was the re lead advocate with the House, sort of watering it down a bit, but moving the House forward. And it's Nixon and Muskie, not Humphrey and Muskie, but Nixon and Muskie, for whom we have to thank for the first Clean Air Act in 1972. This was a bipartisan effort, and I think we can get back to that. Right? Uh, when we talk about this, though, there are also people involved. So the Keeling Curve was done first by Charles, and now by his son, Ralph Keeling. And it's a family affair, and Ralph is 62 and really doesn't want to do this forever, so he's trying to figure out how to change this. But this curve is going monotonically up, and I want to talk to you about another data set that looks at coal, and it's going down. Gene Likens, the founder of the Cary Institute, 
has been working at the Hubbard Brook Experimental Station for 55 years. And in the early 70s, he and a friend, Herb Borman at Yale, just cut down all the forests, uh, you know, all the wood trees in one drainage at Hubbard Brook. There are eight drainages because they're scientists. They want to know what would happen, you know, biogeochemically and ecologically if you cut down all the trees. Well, what they found was there was a lot of acid coming out of those waters. So they had weirs and they would sample the water every week and look at the acidity, and they were shocked. And so they traced it back to coal-fired plants and what we call nitrix and so sulfur and nox and sox release in the Midwest that was then being carried over and then dropped on the Northeast. And that's where acid rain came from. Gene and Herb coined the term, and I asked Gene recently, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, was that intentional? He said, oh yeah, if we'd said you know, low, pH, acidif uh, low pH acidified uh, precipitation in the Northeast, it wouldn't have gotten much traction. Acid rain really did. And Gene uh, was instrumental in getting the revision of the Clean Air Act in 1990 uh, to uh, address the issue. So there had been declines already because of shifts to other fuels, but then, you know, with good regulation, we can change the world. And that we have done this over and over is really important for re people to realize. Gene, another carry scientist, Gary Lovett, uh, Tim Sullivan, a bunch of people, Charlie Driscoll again, it's a very small community, right, wrote a paper last year on success stories and why long-term monitoring is important. And what were these success? Well, we're now down below the national standard on lead. Uh, ozone concentrations have dropped. And these are different studies in different places. Ozone generally is one of the great success stories. The ozone hole in the Arctic that was caused by CFC release, it turned out that there was a better, cheaper chemical we could use. We created the Montreal Protocol. Economics and science drove the reduction. And we're starting to see now, because it takes a long time for these things to degrade, the decline in, in CFCs and the closing up of that ozone hole. Um, you can look at Hubbard Brook acid rain. You can look at acid rain, Big Moose Lake. And you can thank, you know, uh, Rachel Carson. Right? And again, I wanted to emphasize that people really do matter. Now, I'm going to shift into the final piece of this, which is things I really care about, which is animals and particularly large carnivores. And I think we hear about everything going to hell in a handbasket, and carnivores are disappearing, and that is the narrative. And I think it's a bad narrative because it's not true. Right? So in Europe, a couple of years ago, a study was done, and they looked at bears and wolves and ungulates, and I'm just going to do a couple species for each of these, because otherwise I'd spend the whole night on this. Um, so wolves always existed in Italy. They existed in Eastern Europe. It turns out that economic growth is not all that good for wildlife, and that slower uh, economic growth in the east of Europe, um, behind the Iron Curtain, uh, they inadvertently did pretty good conservation by not having as rapid economic development. Those wolves are now recolonizing much of their former range. And wolves have been a great success story. Why? Well, increasing public acceptance is important. And that's when I talked about cultural change on solar fields. Same thing with wildlife. You've got to want to have it. Right? We've given legal protection in Europe and in the United States to these things. There's an increase in ungulate numbers in part just because of better conservation, in part because there are fewer hunters. That has other problems because hunters have always been really great advocates for conservation. So there, there are swings and roundabouts on this. Um, and then there's been subsequent natural dispersal. So that's why wolves have regained or are regaining much of their territory in Europe. Oh, yeah, and there was a guy, another person, Luigi Boitani, who's been doing this since the late 60s. Uh, the last populations of wolves in Italy in the Abruzzo, Abruzzo Mountains. And Luigi um, was the one who said, I'm going to save them. And quite seriously, as a single individual and then you know, dozens of people who worked with them, they've done so. Right? You'll know that we reintroduced wolves into uh, the, the Mountain West. It's been a phenomenal success story. We have over 2,000 wolves now, free ranging. What people also don't know is we have 4,000 wolves in the Midwest, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan was, and in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And that this is a natural recovery. And so wolves are doing really well. Uh, mountain lions in the United States, I've shifted as you saw, I came over, came home. Mountain lions are, are really recovering in the Midwest. They've made some forays into the Northeast. This one here in Connecticut in Greenwich was killed on the road. It's a natural dispersal from uh, North Dakota. There's a male who started heading east and got lost and just kept going, looking for a date. Didn't get there. Um, and this is true of black bears. And, and I'm writing a paper right now on carnivore recovery across North America. But no matter where you look at black bears, they were almost extinct in every state. Uh, and now their density, you know, they're abundant or common. 
uh, Illinois, um, you know, uh, Oregon, uh, in um, Tennessee, and New York. And what you see is these are relatively recent expansions uh, in the last 30 years. Right, so there have always been black bears in New York and Connecticut, but they're really coming back. Anybody who lives around here doesn't need to be reminded of that. Right? Uh, bobcats, right? uh, mountain lions, uh, you know, wolves are rebounding, river otters, black bears, uh, wolverines, uh, fishers, whole other story. But these things are coming back, cougar populations, uh, bobcats are now found in every county in Connecticut. Ten years ago, they were only found in Litchfield, so we have provided uh, a source of bobcats for the rest of the state. Um, you know, and so, what are the conclusions here? And I'm going to actually hit two, uh, 45 minutes. Um, so, trends are shifting from bad to good. Right? And this is true, I think, on carbon, it's true on wildlife, it's true on a lot of pollutants. We really should celebrate all the things we have achieved in the last 40 years, we should celebrate that regulation works. We should celebrate that we now have checks and balances in the Congress so that we're not going to pass uh, laws that are uh, going to turn us back from this. Some of these things need to be reconsidered. There is no question that laws need to be revised. We've revised the Clean Air Act a number of times. I mean, the first legislation on clean air and clean water was in the 50s, and it was useless. But we revised it. We made it better. And so I'm optimistic that we can do that. Right? It's late in the day, there are some real consequences. As I said, Jeremy Jackson, in his book um, uh, on, on the uh, state of affairs of American environmentalism, classifies things into three categories. The ones I've been talking about, which are, we know how to do it, it's a question of political will, and changing perverse subsidies. The second one is the ones where, you know, climate change and sea ocean rise, you know, sea, sea level rise, we're going to have to figure out how to adapt to it in places, but we have methods and methodologies to do that, and many of them we can. And then there are the irreversible catastrophes, loss of, of many species, loss of a lot of corals, uh, melting of the ice caps to a level that is irreversible, at least for the next 100 or 150 years, where we're just going to have to acknowledge that we screwed up and move on. All right, so we're late to the game, but the game's not over. And I think there are enough things that we know how to do that we should be optimistic, right? Change is happening, right? um, That is particularly apt when I wrote this, that wasn't true, and I'm feeling a little better. Uh, and I think more importantly, further change is possible. We're not going to solve every problem with technology, but our technologies are improving, right? The, the LED light bulb, right, is a miracle of energy conservation. There is a reason the people who figured it out got the Nobel Prize. It's not just because it's technologically important, it's because it's environmentally important. And that single invention theoretically could knock 10% off our energy use overall, maybe 6%, you know, depending on how you calculate it. But it's huge. And so there are going to be some technological fixes. I don't think throwing iron in the ocean is necessarily a good idea, uh, but we might get there. I hope not. Um, and while optimism, optimism is hard, it's necessary. So let me just talk about carnivores, because that's what I love. And the sort of the narrative has been for a couple decades, they're disappearing, they're going under, and in many places, Southeast Asia, they've bottomed out more or less, but they're in really bad shape. Africa, they're in decline. Europe, South America, North America, they're either stable or increasing. But the problem was that we were looking at some sort of uh, rose-tinted glasses on what the world looked like pre-industrial, and comparing now to that pre-industrial time. If you go back to the 1920s and 1930s, carnivores were a mess. In North America, almost any carnivore you look at was you know, extinct over 90% of its range and reduced in numbers significantly. So where we have data, and there aren't good data, but where we have data, we know they really were hanging on by the skin of their teeth. Now they're in recovery and bouncing back really quickly, rebounding, as those quotes said. So a lot of this is also about what you measure, where you measure it, and what you take as your baseline. If you take a pre-industrial society as your baseline, you know, we'll have an average life expectancy of 37 years, and, you know, 80% of our kids will die before they reach adulthood. And, oh yeah, by the way, there'll be a lot more wildlife, right? So it's really problematic, and picking your baseline carefully is important, and being optimistic is important, because I think we inspire people through optimism, and we discourage them through pessimism. So while I think it's perfectly okay, and the doom and gloom I spent the first 22 minutes talking about is real, I think the answers are more important and the optimism is more important.
and I hope if I haven't convinced you of that, you'll ask me some questions that will give me a chance to do so. So thank you very much. I forgot my punchline, which is the glass is one-eighth full. <laughs> First of all, thank you. Um, I have a pet peeve. But I have many pet peeves. But you've really dealt with it. Language. So your friend, rather than talking about um, low basic whatever, used the term acid rain. Which right. I thought was brilliant. Climate change is so friendly. <laughs> and so I would love you and your scientists, I use the word climate crisis, but that doesn't go with your option. Catastrophic climate disturbance. That's nice too. Right? Yeah. But if you could, I think it's... Question, so would you be willing to consider changing from climate change to something else? So if I had a magic wand, um, yes, I would be happy to. Um, I think language is important, and I think sugarcoating things is not necessarily a good idea. Um, you know, carnivore, large carnivore recovery is real. It's, it's good language. Um, uh, but yeah, if we want to call it catastrophic climate disruption, CCD, I um, would be happy to do so. What's in it for the climate deniers, uh, other than their own pocketbook? All right, so let's go to that 2% of climate scientists and, and, and geophysicists who don't think that climate change is human driven. I think to be kind, there is in everything, scientists are really good. We live in worlds of probabilities and statistical probabilities. I mean, we take a one in 20 chance of something being wrong as being right. So if there's a 95% chance that something is true statistically, we take that as acceptable. So some of it is just people want more proof because it's 98%, 99%, 199.9%. There still is that possibility that this is all being driven by natural variation in the climate. And if you go back through history, there has been wide and significant variation in climate. So I think there is a scientific argument, but if you go to the consensus, which is I think what we must do for policy, because consensus is, as I said, the lowest common denominator we can agree on, there's no question about it. I think what's interesting, this book that was reviewed in Science this morning, which I have not read, but I read the review, basically argues that it was as politics became more extreme, and particularly as the Republican Party became much more conservative, there was uh, in, uh, an infusion of a discussion from the religious right about humans role and also from an economic perspective about the technology fix and that that came together in a somewhat unholy alliance to create some, you know a, a denial not because it may not be true but because fundamentally there's a belief that we can always fix it if it is true and we shouldn't worry about it and that it is also privileging econ immediate economic growth over long-term economic growth. So it, it, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. I think the answer is that when you go out there, it's like the Endangered Species Act. The vast majority of Republican congressmen have voted for gutting the Endangered Species Act, but the vast majority of Americans don't want it. And so there's this um, decoupling because we've become one-party people who vote, a uh, one-issue people who vote for the issue we most care about, and then all the other things we care about sort of fall by the wayside. And I'm hoping that some of the newly elected congressmen, there's this group of, of uh, veterans who are committed because they got funding from a PAC that raised money for veterans, but they are committed to talking to each other. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I think giving money to people who are willing to talk to each other would be a really good way to get a better Congress. So, do you know about the recent election of the Brazilian President Bolsonaro? Uh, Bolsonaro. How could one not know about Bolsonaro and be an environmentalist? Yeah, so... I guess I'm just wondering what you think about that, because I've been starting to feel hopeful for a lot of the reasons you've been talking about, and that was so discouraging for me. His plans to like privatize the Amazon, yeah. sell most of it off to timber companies. I mean, like, what do you think about that? <laughs> I think it's pretty clear what I think about that. Um, yeah. What do we do about it? Yeah. So I think there are a lot of Brazilians, and I was just talking to a friend of mine in Brazil, a scientist down there, there is going to be, I mean, their courts are not as strong as ours, but there are going to be challenges. The majority of Brazilians don't want that to happen. It was one of the things that he ran on. But it's a politics of fear, and I think, again, hopefully we will see a pendulum swing. It takes a long time to destroy the Amazon. 
We've been working really hard at it for 40 years. Uh, it's a really big forest. So, you know, I'm not going to argue that it's a good thing. I, I think the uh, increasing polarization and the increasing um, uh, nationalist movements uh, make it hard to fight these things globally. But again, I don't think it's the end. I think, you know, Brazil particularly, there's going to be something that happens there that's going to change the political landscape within two months because Brazil is one of the most unstable countries politically in the globe. And so one can just hope that Brazil doesn't figure out how to stabilize. Right. But no, I don't, I don't have good answers other than there are, you know, much of the Brazilian population doesn't like that idea either. Right. They've, they've grown used to being at the lead of the environmental movement. And so, you know, people voted for, out of fear, people voted for lots of reasons. But whether that will translate into rapid policy change, I don't think so, but I hope not. I mean, and there are also really amazing things happening in Brazil on forest restoration. So we're not restoring it as fast as we're cutting it. But again, we're getting much better at restoring it. And so hopefully we can sort of accelerate that and, and you know, through civil disobedience and tying ourselves to trees and other such things, slow down the cutting of trees. Um, so uh, I'm going to spend the weekend thinking about whether uh, I'm as optimistic as you are. But um, I'm going to ask you to, to do a little thought experiment. Uh, let's say we solve the, the carbon problem and to your interest in species uh, extinction and, and survival, which has been accelerating for some time. Yeah. Let's say we solve the carbon problem in, in some period of time. W what's the outlook without significant economic change? You mentioned uh, Eastern Europe and economic growth. You know, if, we don't, if, if we carry on in the business as usual mode after solving this carbon problem, uh, what's the future look like for in the uh, ecosystems for species extinction? So let me start by saying, even you know, if we solve carbon, there's another thing that's really impressive, and that's energy conservation. And I never understand why it gets short shrift. Right? But fundamentally, California has made huge progress, in large measure, through conservation programs, through, through utilities paying people to buy energy efficient uh, 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 appliances, because it's cheaper for them to subsidize that than to build more power plants. Right? And so energy efficiency in many ways, and technology on automotive uh, consumption and uh, heat and energy use in cities, we've been doing well on that and we're going to do better. I think we are on a trajectory to lose half the species on the earth. We've done it before, and as somebody who's trained as a paleontologist in my undergraduate career, it's tragic. It is like burning our museums. That's what happened in Brazil recently. Maybe there's a way back to that. Um, but you know, fundamentally, it's bad. I think it is destabilizing. But ecosystems are redundant to a level that I think they will you know, survive with fewer species. My greatest worry is all the things that we don't really understand, or what Donald Rumsfeld would call the unknown unknowns. So we're having a lot of harmful algal blooms in fresh water that are compromising fresh water sources for human consumption. Forget what it's doing to you know, fish and red tides in Florida and all that. But, but these harmful algal blooms are happening, and they're happening in areas with lots of nitrogen and lots of phosphorus, and we know that that's why it's happening. But they're happening in lakes that are, nothing's pristine, but are very low nitrogen, very low phosphorus, and they're still getting algal blooms. And there's some thought that maybe this has to do with personal care products and pharmaceuticals and shifts in the structure of algal communities towards bad things from good things. And because algae are really important, you don't want to get rid of all the algae because they're what feed everything that we eat on, what we feed on. But fundamentally, I'm more worried about that in some ways than climate change because this is at a stage of research and understanding that is primitive at best. It's being amplified by climate change because temperature affects algal growth, and that's clearly part of it. But so I don't think there's an easy answer. We're going to lose, I, I think Elizabeth Colbert is absolutely right, we're going to lose a lot of species. The good news is that the species that have the greatest ecological impact tend to be common and widespread, and what we're going to lose is the narrowly distributed endemics. And that's not entirely uh, a safe thing, and particularly in tropics where you've got these very buffered ecosystems with lots of different species doing the same thing going to be harder. Over the really long term, I'm not worried, because evolution is amazing, right? and it's going to change. You know, it will recover. I mean, give it five million years, things will be fine. <laughs> right. Right. Humans, not so, not so good. Right. Right. I worry more for my 13-year-old than I do for me. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about fauna. What about flora? What about plant life? Uh, so, right, I'm a fauna guy, which is why I talk about fauna. 
Um, flora, I think equally uh, so. There are wonderful studies in the tropics where um, a guy named Al Gentry, who unfortunately died in a, a plane accident about 20 years ago, but Al would go out and collect uh, uh, plants for the uh, Missouri Botanical Gardens and he'd, he'd identify them and then he'd go back to the ridge where he collected them to recollect them and the ridge had been plowed over and turned into a field. Right? And so I think plants, you know, the greatest diversity of identified uh, 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 organisms are, are vascular plants, and I think we're, we're going to lose just as many of those, if not more of them, as we're going to lose fauna. Some of the larger, more charismatic fauna is more susceptible because they range over larger areas, they have migratory pathways that are being compromised, and the plants win on that. I'm more optimistic on climate change for many of the plants than I am for the animals because they disperse through the air and on the, the, as we like to say, the feet of muddy-footed ducks. Right, seeds are, are more easily transported, and the seed banks that already exist uh, have things in there that will never um, you know, uh, germinate under current conditions, but may in the future. And up in the Northeast, um, it's pretty clear that our forests are going to be fine, except for forest pests and pathogens and other threats, but that these trees experience 100, 110 degree variation annually, and a couple degrees either way isn't going to make a big difference for adult trees. We think it's going to affect what we call the recruitment or the growth of the saplings. And so saplings are going to you know, have trouble establishing. But for the next 50 to 150 years, the forests are going to be in pretty good shape. And then there, there's going to be a fairly significant shift uh, by all the things that are actually able to germinate in the understory. But that's a thumbnail. I think the answer is it's just as bad for plants as it is for animals. And you guys are taking me into depressing things. So <laughs> get a little uplift, please. Uh, Josh. Um, the, the IPCC report uh, is suggesting and projecting that uh, we're going to have catastrophic climate change by 2040. Yeah. And are you, is your optimism suggesting that that might not happen that soon, or do you think that's something that... So uh, I'll go back to the Jeremy Jacks. There are going to be things that happen. Look, uh, if you own property in Florida, I would sell it. <laughs> now. Values are high, it's crazy, you know, Miami, you know, Key West, you know, Naples, my aunt lives in Naples, but she's 90, so she's safe. Um, but, you know, I would sell it, right, because I think that there are sea level rise issues that we are not going to be able to deal with, except for in Manhattan, where, you know, a square inch of earth is worth a billion dollars, right? So there's an economic imperative, right? Rock, far rock away, parts of Staten Island, less sanguine, right? Parts of the Connecticut coast, not looking good, right? Um, particularly when you get a northeaster coming down the Sound that pushes the Sound all the way into Westport. Right? Um, so I think there are going to be things that we can't do anything about that are going to be catastrophic. I think other things, I mean, I think we are going to get ahead of it. I hope we start getting that conversion to renewables faster and faster. It looks like we're still going to have the 30% tax credit for solar. Wind is doing well. We've got a couple wind generation facilities going in offshore. And while they have problems, oh my gosh, they are hugely powerful. Thai energy still remains a tremendous opportunity that we have not yet availed ourselves of. Uh, there are biomass fuels that are not trees. Uh, switchgrass is a good one, but there are things that we can uh, turn into fuel uh, that are much better than corn that we don't have to subsidize to make economic. And so I, I think the answer is, look, there are going to be a lot of really bad things happening within my lifetime if I make it to 90. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking about you know, my great-grandchildren's lifetime, and we're going to have to go through a, a really bad bottleneck, but when we get out of it, for lots of reasons, I think things will be better. Anything else? Anything? Josh, in point after point that you made of improvement, it is the consequence of economics and science being tied together. Uh, if we were to go back 50 plus years, uh, there was no value assigned to clean water. Right. There was no value assigned to clean air. And so they were trashed. And with science and economics coming together, converging on effectively cost internalization uh, or getting the price right for the resource, uh, that has led to this enormous improvement that you correctly cited. But economics are being ignored 
as much as science is being ignored currently. Uh, science will proceed, but economics involves more of the populace at large. Do you see a, 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 an effort to try to get the economic component at pace with and concurrent with the science and help us break forward? All right, so those of you who don't know Roger Liddell, it's uh, important to recognize somebody in the audience who knows significantly more about uh, alternative energy than I do uh, and about the economics of it. So Roger, I think the answer is, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I do know, you do know, so, so we can talk later. I do know that, that there are perverse subsidies throughout the federal budget, um, many of which I think are starting to come into question. I think one of the interesting things for me is that when I say the libertarian right and, and the liberal left agree on a lot of this. And it will be a really interesting thing if we can get the corn ethanol subsidy out, if we can put back in better subsidies for land conservation, if we can change the way that we invest in research and development, because look, NSF, DOE, those, those investments uh, for primary research and its link to economic uh, implementation are really poor, I would agree with you. But again, I think that book by Mike Bloomberg and Carl Pope is really a, a, a sort of a beacon of light because you've got somebody who really knows economics and cares deeply about it, and you've got somebody who's a, you know, a strong environmentalist, and then you've got that third leg of the stool, the, the scientific community, and I think we're all starting to get a little less dogmatic and a little more practical as the stakes get higher. So, you know, am I optimistic? I don't know whether I should be or not, but I do think that there are venture capitalists who are looking at the return on their investment and seeing that, you know, putting it into coal, you know, coal uh, gasification isn't really a good idea anymore, and maybe we should do something else. There are people looking at carbon capture, and I think carbon capture is still 15 to 20 years off. The technologies are good, but they're really expensive. So unless we subsidize the, the capture of carbon, costs like, what, $25, $30 a ton right now, maybe $100 a ton, I'm not sure where the break is, but it's still 10 or 20 times what we're valuing carbon at in the open market. And so unless we essentially jack up the price through a carbon tax, which, oh, by the way, ExxonMobil has put a million dollars towards research in a carbon tax, and has said they're not a given, right? And so I think that when we look at the economics of these subsidies and the changes of both taxation and subsidizing uh, bad behavior, we could make a lot of progress really fast with the good science we have and, and the strong economic drivers that this country is really good at. So optimistic, I don't know whether I should be, but you can tell me. I have a question for you which uh, deals with the problem of timing and, and, and environmental change. It typically takes 50 years to make a conversion from one primary fuel, for instance, wood to coal, and coal, coal eventually to oil, um, to, for, to carry out the conversion from one primary fuel to another. So how do you get Certainly, if you read the late, the latest climate change uh, climate <coughs> study, it, it, the danger is possibly within 30 or 40 years. So, how do you, how do you uh, recommend speeding up the political process? Maybe it's a combination of economics, whatever it is. But how do you any suggest any suggestions for that? Uh, so, well outside my bailiwick, but all I can say is. We have already, we've spent 40 years on alternative energy production and research and investment, and I think we're already well into that. And so the question I would have is how we change our consumption patterns, how we change storage. You know, the, the real challenge now is if we were to accelerate uh, alternative energy production, particularly solar, how do you store that energy? And the good news is people are coming up with some really clever ways to do it, um, which don't involve cutting off mountaintops and pumping water up and letting it flow down, but they involve taking you know, blocks of concrete the size of this room, raising them up on cranes that have energy production in them, and then as you know, the sun goes down and the, the, the cement starts dropping and producing electricity, it's turning uh, hybrid vehicles and plug-in vehicles into battery, those batteries into storage devices so that as we're pumping out too much electricity uh, in, in the downtimes, we store it in vehicles. Uh, I think there are, or houses, um, there are a lot of ways to do it. I don't know the answer to that because it's well beyond my economic knowledge. Uh, 
but I'm optimistic that at least I know that we are well on the way to those changes. As I said, you know, it was Henry Ford in, uh, uh, sorry, Thomas Edison in 1931. It was Avery Lovins in 1977. You know, we're, we're 40 years on, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's getting there. Can you comment on the, on the success of the Eastern Coyote. It seems to me it's a optimistic story. <laughs> All right. So that actually is something I know something about. Thank you. Right. So a student of mine and I and a couple other people wrote a paper 15 years ago on the colonization of New York by coyotes. And they came in from the north in the 20s and the west in the 40s. That's the 1920s and 1940s. And basically it was a wide open niche that was filled by coyotes when wolves left, right? We got rid of wolves at the, you know, pretty much by the turn of the 20th century, they were gone, and coyotes wasted no time filling that niche and have done so remarkably. Now, when we bring mountain lions back and they're gonna get back or we're gonna bring them back, wolves a little harder because the most likely place for them to come in is across the St. Lawrence. We've been running uh, icebreakers up and down that for 40 years, and now we're melting it, so it's not gonna be easy. Uh, but if we were to have wolves and, and mountain lions, you'd see many fewer coyotes. If you look in the Rockies at the reintroduction, well, the remarkable thing is that when you bring wolves in, you knock coyotes back by 50%. And I remember chatting with Senator Max Baucus from Montana about that, and uh, he's a sheep rancher. And when I told him that there was a way to knock back coyotes 50%, he looked at me and said, what is it? And I smiled and said, wolves. <laughs> and his only comment was, God, I wish the Fish and Wildlife Service had told me that. Right? Um, but so, coyotes are just a great example of nature of horrors of vacuum. And uh, a vacuum we had, and it's being filled. I read an article last week in, uh, I think it was in many publications, I read it in the BBC, but um, that uh, the oceans are turned out to have absorbed 60% uh, more heat than uh, initially thought. Apparently, they had a new way of measuring. Uh, Ocean, the average ocean temperature, which is yeah. very, very difficult to do, I understand. Does that, and it also indicates that CO2 has a much more profound impact than initially thought. Does that shatter your, your optimism a little bit? Yes. <laughs> uh, my only thought is that it is a new study using new techniques, and you know, the reality is I think these studies are really important. I think they provoke faster action, but fundamentally it's not news that the ocean is reaching its capacity to absorb heat. Right? That it's doing it 60% faster is scary, that CO2 is more of a problem than we thought it was is frightening, but it doesn't frighten me or scare me any more than what I already knew. It just changes the time frame a bit. Um, and so I think we just need to rush forward and, and embrace change even faster, but, but it doesn't really fundamentally shift either my pessimism or my optimism, optimism, it means there are going to be probably more bad things happening and, and we're going to have to move faster if we want to avoid that. If you were giving this talk in China or India, would you be optimistic? Are they passing clean water and clean so, air acts? Uh, so China, particularly India, less so, but they're further behind on the development curve. China's moving very quickly in many places to exceed and, and uh, uh, show us up for uh, energy change, right? So they are very tired of their polluted environment. They're like we were, Beijing now is like New York in the 60s, and they don't like it. And yes, they are moving forward both legislatively but also politically. One of the great advantages of a totalitarian system is it can turn on a dime, right? And it can turn on a dime badly and, and, and positively. And I think this is when we do a lot of work at the Cary Institute with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, particularly with their Urban Ecology Institute, where a lot of the thinking about how to improve urban environments is happening globally. And you know, China is building cities faster than anybody else. And they are really focusing on sustainability in a way that a lot of countries that have to retrofit aren't. So you know, most of our water treatment plants are, or systems and our sewage systems are 100 years old, they're leaky. And if we do a big infrastructure project, I hope we build fewer roads and bridges, because that just encourages people to drive, and instead do stuff on, on renewable energy and, and water infrastructure, which I think is even more important and even more dilapidated. So yes, China's doing it, India's getting there. India is looking at a different energy path of distributed solar energy, because so many of their people not just live in poverty, but live off the grid. And the World Bank has a great program that a colleague of mine is working on to bring solar, distributed solar, small-scale solar to the Indian countryside and sort of 
in the same way that, that much of India and Africa leapfrogged on, on cell technology and never got copper wire. They just went straight to cell phones. I think there's an opportunity there as well. But again, outside my area of expertise. Um, there is something else that, uh, can I close, Frank, on, a, on another positive note? Um, so uh, this is a piece of work that came out uh, tomorrow. Right. Uh, and uh, this is a, a picture from the Encyclopedia Britannica that came out seven years ago. Who knew that there was still an Encyclopedia Britannica? Uh, but this looks at, at the world population and projections on a low growth scenario, a medium growth scenario, or a high growth scenario. And I think it will surprise everybody to know we're, we're sort of tracking on that medium growth. We, we missed the low growth. We're almost at 8 billion people already. But we're, we're tracking on that. And the study that came out looked at changes in fertility globally uh, over the last um, 70 years. And what they found was that global fertility rates have been declining quickly. And we're now down to about 2.5 children per woman on this planet. 2.2, 2.1, somewhere between those, is, is replacement. And we've come from almost five. Right? And this is a piece of news that you don't hear very often. Right? Every country in the world showed declines in birth rates. 33 countries in the study of 190 are in negative growth. Right? And you know, I'd like to end by thanking Paul and Ann Ehrlich, who are pilloried all the time for writing a book in 1970, right before things started going down, called The Population Bomb, which was a sort of Malthusian uh, pay-in to, can we please think about human population growth and do something about it? And you know, it's the one Earth problem for experimental science. We need five or six Earths so we can experiment on them. <laughs> There's only one human population on one Earth. And you could argue that Paul and Ann got it entirely wrong. Or you could look at 1970 as the point at which we started doing something about it. And I would say that if any two people on Earth should get some credit for raising the issue. Now, Paul is no slouch. And Ann has a PhD. Paul is one of the senior faculty at Stanford in, in ecology. His real love and life is checker spot butter, uh, butterflies uh, and, and is a really brilliant evolutionary biologist. He stepped out of his comfort zone to take a stand and say, this is a big problem. It has an ecological basis. We can look at that. But this is a social problem. And so I think scientists are capable of changing the world. And I'm glad I work with a bunch of them that try. And uh, you know, we're not going to do it alone. We need economists. We need you guys to write your new congresswoman uh, and tell her how important the environment is to you. Uh, and I think we can make change together. So thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of your weekend.